Hello and welcome back to Essentials of Computer Architecture, Computer Architecture and Organization. We're moving into the third major portion of Coomer, where we're going to be talking about input and output I.O. And this first chapter will give you uh, an orientation to some of the nomenclature, the, the terminology that will commonly come across um, your way. And so let's go ahead and get started. So um, the IO devices is a third major component of a computer system. And there's a wide range of IO devices that will be out there. Uh, keyboards and mice, monitors and displays, hard drives, solid state disks, um, SSDs, that's becoming quite popular, um, printers, cameras, speakers, sensors and actuators, all kinds of things. And I put in a picture of a um, computer motherboard. It's starting to get a little bit dated um, in terms of some of the um, type of features that it has, but the, the motherboard is where the, the processor is actually hooked in, the memory is hooked in, and then you have it, various types of external devices that are shown here. It's like the, the, the master plan of where everything is integrated to, together. Um, and so all kinds of things, that, some of which we won't get into, but you can see um, things are mentioned here in terms of the front panel switches, audio. Audio would be an example of an I.O. having the USB slots, um, cabinet front end USB. And so that's how you would be um, using, um, hooking in a keyboard and mice, for example. Um, you would be having your, your video and other types of things. And so you're not seeing them very well here. This is a VGA connector, but there's other types of connectors here as well. So that's just a little bit of an overview of some of the things that we'll be talking about. In terms of the conceptual properties of an I.O. device, um, it's the, it operates independent of a processor. Um, it may have a separate power supply. Um, the, the digital signals um, are used for control. And so here is a trivial example of a panel light. And so first of all, you need some kind of processing capability to define when and under what circumstances a, a light will come on. Um, digital signals, control signals are sent out. And so here is the control logic that actually turns them on. So the controller or microcontroller that, that sets things up the circuits that specifically have the switches and the power to, to make it happen, and then you have the physical lights. That would be an example of um, some of the properties that you would be thinking about that um, when you have a processing capability and you need to communicate with an external world, there needs to be a way of hooking those things up and the I.O. is um, where that happens. Here's an illustration of a modern interface controller. The controller is placed at each end of a physical connection and allows arbitrary voltage and signals to, to be used. So once again, here's a processor. You have the, the controls, which are then um, um, has a conduit where you can have input and output relaying of that information to the device. And so this is the I.O. plane that you're, you're thinking about. So here's a couple types of interfaces. The first is a serial interface and the second is a parallel interface. Serial uses a single signal wire um, and notice that it also needs ground and one bit is set at a time. So serially, one at a time is how it, it flows. It's less complex hardware with, with lower cost. And the other one is a parallel interface. It has many wires. Each wire carries one bit at any time. And it, it width is the, the number of wires. It has complex hardware with higher cost. And theoretically, it's faster than serial, but there are practical limitations at high data rates on close parallel wires have potential for interference. Um, USB um, is an example of a serial interface that, that has gotten more complicated and other types of connections. Um, uh, SATA interface is another example. 
and other types of things that would come up in IO devices. So what about clock rates and coordination? The, there's logic on each side of a connection and it has its own clock. So there, there's a processor and an IO device. So these have to be synchronized. Um, the, the communication must be designed so that they can coordinate. Um, we can say that signals are self clocking if the receiver can determine the boundary of bits without knowing about the, the sender's clock. And so that's just a, a construct that, that there are constructs for that allow that to happen. Let's talk about terminology. Terminology, there's a couple um, things that come up with duplex. You can either have full duplex or half duplex. Full duplex means there's simultaneous bi-directional transfer of information. So as an example, a disk drive can support um, simultaneous read and write operations. Um, half duplex is transfer in one direction. It's like a walkie-talkie, only one person can talk at a time and then you have to let the channel open and then it can um, radiate information in the opposite direction. Interfaces must be negotiated uh, um, access before trans transmitting. So in this case, an example would be a processor can read or write to a disk, but it can't perform this, the both operations um, simultaneously. So what are some of the important measures of IO performance? The first is latency. It's a measure of the time required to perform a transfer, and latencies of input and output may differ. Um, we bumped into that when we were talking about memories. Um, a read or a write cycle, sometimes they're not the same. Another factor is throughput, which is measures the amount of data that can be transferred per user unit time. Informally, it's called speed, and it, if you are familiar with some of the, the data standards for USB 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, 3.1, and other types of um, um, USB-C. There's things that they're typically, they give a, a transfer rate speed because that's an important factor. Um, what about data multiplexing? It's a, it's a fundamental idea. It arises from hardware limits on parallelisms. You only can have so many pins or wires, it allows for, for sharing. So a multiplexer accepts inputs from many sources. It sends each item along with um, an ID. Um, a D um, multiplexer, on the flip side, it re receives the ID along with the transmission. It uses the ID, ID to reassemble items correctly. So if things get um, received out of order, it can put them back together in the right order. So here's an example of multiplexing. Let's consider 64 bits of data multiplex over 16-bit um, pass. And so that 64 can be broken into four chunks of 16, and then you can have one at a time. Those things are, 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 are sent through. So this, this might be a more realizable IO bus that you would be using, but you have to be getting one chunk of data through at a time. So that, that would how it conceptually can be thought of. Um, what about multiple devices per external interfaces? Um, you cannot afford to have a separate physical connection per device. Um, that would be a whole lot of IO um, connections. So it would take too many wires. There's not enough pins or processors on a processor chip and the interface hardware as economic cost. And so these are the things that would mo move us in the direction of having multiple devices for an uh, external interface. The solution is sharing. It allows multiple devices to use a given interconnection. This is known as a bus. And this will be talked about in detail when we go over the next section. And this is a quick introduction. And so we'll go ahead and um, say that that's all we'll, we'll cover for now. Thank you.